Homework 14 I've collected, and uh, that's the last homework assignment of the semester. The last thing that you've got on your list to think about is the project. Um, just like we've done for the last couple of classes, I'd be welcome, I'd welcome any questions that you might have for the project. Anything that's come up as you've been working on it you want to ask about? I sent an announcement on uh, Tuesday. When I got the email version of that announcement, it looked like the formatting was a little bit strange. But if you go into iLearn, then that table makes more sense. Did everyone get a chance to look at the, uh, the table that shows an idea of what you should do to summarize your data? The different columns that it said is that for every year, there should be a different row. And so um, each row is its own year, and then there should be columns related to income, your ordinary expenses, your extraordinary expenses. And now, remember in the report, I'm also asking you to talk about, you'd learn more if you put away your phones, guys. Um, also, during retirement, you need to think about how your expenses may be different. And so, uh, that doesn't need to be a separate column. It's just that after you stop working, we'll see that possibly uh, the pattern of your expenses changes. And then, of course, the difference between inflow of money and outflow of money is that you get to have your savings increasing. Now, there's a difference between the savings from one year, you know, how much comes into your savings account during that one year, and then the accumulated savings. The accumulating savings uh, takes into account all of the, the pool of money you've saved up until then, and then also you need to be compounding it according to the uh, profit rate or the rate of return that you're making on your investments. So, no questions? All right. Today we're talking about ethics. And this is something that we'll discuss only a handful of times during your education. And uh, it's very, very important. The consequences are high of ethics. Before we get into that, let's uh, talk about a few points related to the final exam. <clears throat> All right. So this section, 8 o'clock, our exam is on Tuesday the 12th from 2 till 4. The one time in the semester you don't need to wake up early. I'm giving you a big exam. So that's how we're celebrating the one time you get to sleep in for the day, all right? Three finals on that day? You'll wake up early anyways. <laughs> all right. Um, and this is also the one time in the semester when you guys don't have to go first. The 9 a.m. section has their test on Monday, and yours is on Tuesday. So. Okay, so the exam is comprehensive, and why do I do that? Is it just because I'm such a mean professor? Sort of. But mainly it's because it would be impossible to have a non-comprehensive exam. There's, this material is very integrated, and there's things that we're doing now that is intimately related to where we started off in the beginning of the semester. For example, uh, the time value of money, you know, P slash A, A slash F. You know, those factors and equations, we're still using that same stuff that we did before. So if I told you, no, it won't be a comprehensive exam, and then I give you a table lookup factor problem, some student would say, well, I didn't study that because it was from the beginning of the semester. So it's just easier for us to acknowledge and admit that, yes, this material is uh, cumulative in nature, and so the exam itself has to be cumulative, okay? Now that said, more of your questions are going to come on the newer material that you've had most recently because you haven't had an exam yet on the content from lectures 28 through 43. So, um, you know, that represents maybe a quarter of the class, maybe, maybe a third, a quarter to a third of the class, but it will represent more than half of the points and questions approximately. So it'll be disproportionately weighted on, uh, on the more recent material. Uh, we will be using Excel. I tried to book the computer classroom, but the uh, schedule isn't online that far in advance. So I still need to do that. But we'll be someplace where you have access to a computer. And we'll have to go through the same process of you uploading your spreadsheet file to iLearn. Of course, you're starting from a blank spreadsheet. You're not starting from a homework or an in-class exercise where you already have the problem solved. Uh, I'll provide 
any lookup factors that you need, you know, the 4% table, 5% table, and so on. And I'll also provide this formula sheet. Um, in addition to this, you're permitted to bring one page and write on the front and the back with formulas and whatever else you'd like to have on that page. And so there are some equations we've used this semester that aren't among this. How do you know what equations to put on your formula sheet? Look through the in-class exercises, look through the homework, look through the notes and see what equations did we use. I'm not suddenly in the final exam going to ask you to begin using an equation that we never used through the semester. Yeah? That's right, yeah. You can put anything on it you want. You can put formulas, procedures, pictures of your favorite football star, whatever motivates and helps you for the exam, all right? Yeah. Yes, you can write on the front and the back. Okay? Um, no, right, good question. So the question is, what about the theory part? Remember how we have concept questions and problem solving? The concept questions, you won't be using either of the formula sheets for that. It'll just be from your mind. Other questions about the final exam? OK. So let's talk about ethics. And um, the relevance of ethics ties into what it is we're doing. The last chapter we've been talking about is cost estimation and trying to decide on the cash flow diagram um, how much our expenses will be in the future because nothing is guaranteed. We're just making predictions. One of the ways that cost estimates are used is to pick among alternatives because if one project looks more expensive than another or if one project looks like an especially good value, then sometimes that project is selected. So there's limited funds in any organization, even in uh, very wealthy areas, they can't do everything. And so take, for example, the, the dilemma that may be faced when they're trying to choose between uh, renovating the fire hall and renovating a hospital. You know, what deserves the money more than the other? Part of a benefit to cost analysis is going to be looking at what are the costs. So here we are talking about cost analysis. How does this tie into ethics? Well, oftentimes, the organizations that are operating a hospital or the fire department will provide estimates of what they need to begin a project. And if those are artificially low at the beginning part of the project, what sometimes has been done in the past is that they, these organizations will say, let's begin this project. It's going to be very cheap. And so the government or whoever's funding the project will put in a lot of money and then during the project, the costs start to rise. What started off as a $1 billion airplane is now a $1.2 billion airplane. And the US Air Force has a real problem with this. Whenever they hire a company to buy them a new airplane, or to build them a new airplane, at first the price looks very attractive. And then when they start the project, then they start raising the prices. It's like if you take your car to the repair shop and they say it's going to be 500 dirhams. And then they start the work and they call you and say, actually, it's going to be 750 dirhams. Well, what are you going to do? They've already started the work. So you have to say, OK, you know, go ahead. Huh? It's, uh, it's not ethical, that's for sure. And some people will say it's illegal. But um, remember, cost estimates are just estimates. And so they can always say, well, at the beginning, when we got started, it was just an estimate. It wasn't necessarily binding. Yeah. Yeah, you should. You should have a contract. But, you know, if the guy doesn't speak English and you're just trying to get your tires replaced, do you think he's going to write a contract for you about it will be 500 dirhams only? No, they just, he just says 500 and you say, OK, start it, do it. <laughs> yeah, for the US Air Force, you'd think they'd be more sophisticated, right? But they're not. They're not. Time and time again, whether it's refueling aircraft or stealth bombers, Every single time they buy something, in the end, the project is double, triple what people said it was going to be. Just because these companies are so good about uh, playing games. Yeah, playing games. And so think about the fire department versus the hospital. Let's say the hospital 
Now, this is just for sake of illustration, but let's say that one of the organizations is full of ethical people who are doing the right thing, and one of them is full of people who are playing games because they want a bigger slice of the budget. And so they're playing games, they're getting more budget, and then the needs of the people who are served by these two organizations suffer because one of them is too big and inefficient, and the other one isn't getting the, uh, the repairs, the upgrades, the expansions that it needs. And so that sort of gives you an idea of why it's important for us to be ethical when we're doing cost estimates. Uh, similar when we're, for one project in particular, it's important to be ethical and reasonable. And ethics isn't always just about dishonesty. Sometimes it's about using methods that are non-standard. Actually, uh, not knowing how to do it the right way can be considered an ethical issue, as we'll see in a moment when we look through some regulations. So, uh, determining what features to include in a building. Uh, this picture on the left is something called AED stands for Automatic External Defibrillator. Have you seen these in the airports before? It's in case if someone's having a heart attack, they need to have a shock to the chest, right? Most of us don't know how to do that. <laughs> We've seen it on TV, so we think maybe we could do it, but this machine does it automatically. Like, there's an untrained person can drag the heart attack victim in front of the machine, rip open their shirt, and put these two electrodes on their chest, and then the computer inside does the work automatically. It searches for the heart signal, confirms that there's nothing, and then it gives them the shock until their heart begins again. It's automatic. That's what the A stands for. So it's a really good thing to have <clears throat> in places where there's lots of people, like airports is where I've seen them most often. But they're expensive. And so are we going to pay for an AED or are we going to pay for <clears throat> a wheelchair lift to improve the accessibility for people who have mobility disorders? Um, we've got limited expenses and anytime we do an analysis of what's going to provide the most benefit, if our numbers are based on uh, data that is skewed by a dishonest vendor or people who have personal relationships with the people providing the equipment, then that can really have a negative influence on the way things should be. Okay, so here's what our book says. Numbered lists are, should always get your attention, especially before an exam. Numbered lists, are, like the numbers, uh-oh, something's being numbered, it's important, right? Okay, so it says in the, in the text that uh, estimates should be based on sound information ga gathered over a range of conditions that are representative of the current situation. All right, so let me give you an illustration of that. Um, <clears throat> uh, what if I was going to get how much it costs here in the UA uh, UAE to, um, to construct a high-rise building? Because there's so many high-rise buildings built in the UAE, probably there's a lot of uh, specialized knowledge. There's a lot of contractors who can do that work. And so this is a very efficient and good place to build a high-rise building. But let's say that now I use that data, that cost data, because um, someone in the rainforest of Brazil decides they want to put in a high-rise building in the middle of the rainforest of Brazil. That would be a terrible, unrepresentative cost data to try and say, I'm going to take the cost analysis from conditions in the UAE and apply that to the middle of the rainforest in Brazil because the materials aren't available, the expertise, the labor, the equipment, and so you can't use a range of conditions that are unlike where you plan to actually do something. And so part one is saying use reasonable data that actually applies to what you are describing in your cost analysis. Okay. Number two, it says that uh, our estimates should be using accepted theory and techniques. Use uh, statistical methods that everyone agrees on. You shouldn't be coming up with your own equation that's no one's seen before that somehow if you do 10 black backflips in a row starts to uh, show that your project will be profitable. The procedures and the techniques we've learned this semester are standardized and accepted across uh, engineering and economics and so they'll help you to draw conclusions that are reasonable. So part two is about using accepted methods instead of uh, making up your own approach just so that it can look favorable to what you're trying to do. And the third thing that's important is that uh, you should keep personal and working relationships separate. And so if your brother is a material supplier or if 
uh, some company gave you a gift in exchange for hoping to get your business, all of that should be avoided and you should avoid bias. The decisions you make should only be based on what's most efficient, what's best for the client, and not what's necessarily best for you. All right. So um, there is an in-class exercise for today. And we're going to do something a little different. Usually we're doing calculations. Today we're going to look through a code of ethics for engineers. Uh, this is the National Society for Professional Engineers. Now, every engineering society has something similar to this. ASCE has a code of ethics that's very similar. Uh, this is one that's suggested and is in the appendix in your textbook, so we'll go with this. I've got four questions here that I'd like you to read the question and then try and find in the language here where it applies or addresses what it's asked. And then we'll talk about some of these answers in just a moment. All right, so here's the code of ethics that you've been looking over. Let's uh, talk about, let's zoom in and talk about section 5B. Of course, we don't have time in one class meeting to talk about all the important stuff that's in here. But uh, section 5 says, engineers shall avoid deceptive acts. And uh, one of the deceptive acts that it's talking about is engineers shall not offer, give, solicit, or receive. What does solicit mean? It means ask for. Uh, or receive, or either directly or indirectly, any contribution to influence the award of a contract by public authority. So you're not supposed to offer any gift or other valuable consideration in order to secure work. Shall not. Mm -hmm. Bribing a public official. So, shall not offer a gift in order to secure work. So, is there someplace else you found that talked about, I mean, it may be in there in more than one location, but I think that a bribe to a public official could be considered offering a gift in order to secure work. Was there something else you had in mind? So, what, what section was it? But which section? Like, tell me the number. Three, two, B. All right. So section three, two, B. Here. Hmm. Okay. So uh, it's clear that uh, bribes shouldn't be offered for work, that it's best for society if whoever picks the engineer is doing it on the basis of, you'll learn more if you put away your phones, guys, is doing it on the basis of who's best for a job rather than who can offer the, uh, the highest bribe. We don't want to live in a society where the building you live in 
was built by the engineer who bribed the most instead of who knew the most. I mean, uh, it really hits home when you think about having to drive over a bridge or be in an elevator or live in a house or, you know, the fire protection system that in the building you're in. Yeah. Who designed it? Hopefully it's the person that was most qualified. Okay, question two says, according to the rules of practice, what should an engineer do if their judgment is overruled under circumstances that endanger people's lives? So what did you find related to that? What should you do? Good. You found it. So if, if your judgment about safety is overruled, you can't just say, well, he's my boss. Um, your duty to preserving public safety and public health is greater than uh, the authority of your boss. And so if your boss says, I don't care, we're going to pour those chemicals into the sand and walk away, and that's unethical, and that, it endangers people's health. And so what you have to do is you have to notify the head of your company or notify the client that your company is working for or other authorities like the government authorities or, uh, or regulators. And so that would make you a whistleblower where you're pointing out the, uh, the dangerous acts of someone else. Any questions about that one? All right. So uh, the next question asks, uh, what's the obligation that's described in 5A? Who can summarize what it says we're obligated to do? Yeah? Right. Exactly. So the equipment supplier, um, again, you should be making your choices on the basis of what's the most efficient, the most affordable, and the best product, not because someone gave you a desk calendar or someone invited you for a nice meal or even here, the thing that jumped out at me, even if they're going to give you a uh, free, uh, including free engineering designs. And that's something, something that suppliers occasionally say is, well, choose us because we'll do the drawing of, for example, the pipe network. We'll do all the, we have a CD that has all of our drawings. And so you shouldn't let that make the basis of your judgment that it will be easier for you to choose one company because, uh, because then you won't have to do as much work to write it up. You should be choosing what's overall the best thing. All right, so the last question on here is uh, Rule Practice 3C. Okay, so let's switch to Rule Practice 3C and see what it is talking about. Where are we? Okay, second page, 3C. Uh, engineers shall issue no statements, blah, 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 uh, unless they have prefaced their comments by explicitly identifying the interested parties on whose behalf they are speaking. So you can't go to a public meeting or to a lawsuit and provide expert testimony as an engineer unless you say who you represent. You can't make it seem like you're being impartial if you've been paid to give your uh, expert testimony for a company and so this would apply in a lawsuit, in public hearings. So in the case of an oil company, um, you, uh, you're supposed to acknowledge the support that you've given so that the people who are listening to your testimony can know what your bias might be. If you're, testimony, if you're testifying for an oil company, maybe you're going to say uh, that there's no danger, there won't be an oil spill, global warming isn't real, we should all drive big cars and use a lot of oil, something like that. But if you're going to say that, it's fine, but you should uh, acknowledge that they're giving you money to say it. That's, that's required on the basis of honesty. Okay.